I am going on a journey. Will you come with me? Our presentation today is entitled, When Does a Day Begin? Do you really know? Does a day really start at night? Or as some like to say, in the evening? Does the Sabbath really begin at evening? At the sunset moment? And continue to the next sunset? Like we have been taught for so many years? Many Sabbath keepers have come to the conclusion that the five words in this phrase the evening and the morning determine the beginning of a new day. Is this your thinking? Your conviction? Many assume, based wholly on tradition, that evening equals the night and the morning equals the day. Is this really how we constitute one day? Do you believe this? The evening equals the night portion of the day and the morning equals the daylight portion of the day. Can this be proven from Scripture? With this PowerPoint presentation, we will see how this traditional teaching is actually not biblical. Are you surprised? Let's do some serious research. Number one, the Roman calendar begins a new day at midnight, the very darkest part of the 24-hour cycle, or the calendar day. Number two, the Jewish reckoning begins a new day at sunset, as their 24-hour calendar day begins its night phase right here at sunset. Number three, many Sabbath keepers started out reckoning the beginning of Sabbath at 6 p.m. on Friday, whether there was a sunset or not. Fourth, Yahweh's instructions in His inspired Word begin a new 24-hour cycle with the first rays of light from the sun at dawn before sunrise. Most people will probably think, does it really matter how one calculates the beginning of a new day? To the majority of the world, it certainly doesn't matter. To the lukewarm Christians, it doesn't seem to matter. To those who search the scriptures for truth, it does matter when the Sabbath begins. To Yahweh, I believe, it matters a lot. He has not written any idle words in scripture. What do you think? Many of us have been taught that a 24-hour time frame is reckoned from evening to evening, meaning sunset to sunset. We have also been taught and assumed that the Sabbath is observed from the moment the sun sets on Friday evening until sunset on Saturday evening. That the terms even and evening are defined as sunset or the whole dark period of the night. Period. Is it possible that the enemy has counterfeited Yahweh's truth on this very point four times over? If so, scripture should provide the truth. We must consider the Hebrew definitions of evening. That's the uh, Hebrew word H6153. The first Hebrew meaning of evening is dusk. That is after sunset. The second Hebrew meaning of evening is day. That is way before sunset. The third Hebrew meaning of evening is 
twilight, about the same as dusk. The fourth Hebrew meaning of evening is night. Now what? Sunset is not one of the definitions. Question, what is sunset? Sunset is a moment of time in the evening when the sun begins to fall below the horizon. The sun can no longer be seen with the physical eye. The time between sunset and night is called dusk or twilight, which is a mixing of light and darkness. Sunrise occurs for only an instant the moment at which the upper limb of the sun appears tangent to the horizon. However, the term sunrise commonly refers to periods of time both before and after this point. Twilight, the period in the morning during which the sky is light but the sun is not yet visible, is called dawn. Another mixing of light and darkness. To begin with, I'd like to say that it is not my intention to put anyone down or to condemn anyone who has a different opinion in this respect. I also like to mention that I am not a scholar or a professional. I just use scripture alone as it is written with available history. I may not have all the answers, but scripture does. It is my intention to present as much proof as possible to support this position that the Sabbath begins at dawn, not at sunset. The Sabbath worship hours close with the darkness of the night. The full 24 hours of Sabbath closes at the last moment before the dawn of the next morning. See Matthew 28 verse 1. And that would be Sunday morning. We must be fair and first look at the evidence from scripture and history. After that a decision can be made. Remember we can't go by tradition. We can't go by the opinions of men. We can't go by the way we have been taught. A good Berean will examine all the evidence. There are nearly 40 examples in the scriptures to support every new day begins with dawn. We will examine six examples from Bible testimonies and also some Jewish historical evidence. In Genesis 1-3 we read, And God said, let there be light, and there was light. That's from the King James Version. Genesis 1-4 God saw that the light was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Genesis 1-5a God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the light equals the day and the darkness equals the night. There are three very different definitions for the Hebrew word yom. Number H3117 meaning day in English. Let's examine the three basic ones. Only the first two apply to this study. Let's first go again to Genesis chapter 1 verse 5b. And the evening and the morning were the first day. First we must examine the word day. This portion of scripture is the one everyone wonders about. Doesn't it say right there that evening comes first? It seems like it.
day, Yom, H3117, the first definition of 12 hours is the warm, hot hours of the day from sunrise to sunset. Yeshua, also known as Jesus, answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? According to John 11.9. The second definition, 24 hours. The hours from one sunset to the next sunset, or from sunrise to sunrise. There seems to be no specific biblical term for the 24-hour cycle or time period. Then we have a third definition, figurative, symbolic, prophetic time. One hour of prophetic time, according to scripture, 15 days of literal time. We read that in Revelation 17:12. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings. They receive power as kings one hour. This would be fifteen literal days with the beast. The word day needs further clarification because day can mean twelve hours or twenty-four hours in this study. The twenty-four hours a cycle I have not found in scripture a specific term for a 24-hour day. Cycle will be the word of choice to specify only a full 24 hours. 12 hours equals a season. In Jeremiah 33, 20 and 21, it states, Thus says Yahweh, If we can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season. Then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant. Thus saith Yahweh, If my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant. Example, 12 hours for the day season and 12 hours for the night season. So what did Yeshua say? In John 11:9, Yeshua answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he sees the light of this world. The logical reasoning, therefore the night season would also have twelve hours to complete the full twenty-four hour circle. The terms day season and night season are important for this study that we are doing today. Also, the Bible does not designate, number one, a literal unit of time as small as a minute, number two, or the moment of sunset, number three, the smallest symbolic prophetic unit of time is about a half hour. And the half hour equals 8 days, or 1 hour equals 15 days. The Greek word hour or hours is also an ambiguous term, but we won't get into that topic right now. Let's examine this day and night issue a little closer. Genesis 1 5 and God called the light or and the day Yom and the darkness Hoshek he called the night Lail. note in that order the two large segments of the full cycle are addressed first God called the light day Yom and the darkness he called Lail, that's the night. This bracket represents a complete 24-hour cycle covering light and darkness, or day and night. A, we got 12 hours, or segment, of time, of light, which is a light season. B, we got 12 hours, or segment of time, 
of darkness. That's the night season. So when we add those together, we have 24 hours or segments of time of one complete perfect light night cycle. Notice light or day came first. The 12 hour day season is further divided into another two parts A. Arab and B. Boker. A. Arab, that's number H, 6153, means first dusk, second day, third even or evening, and four night. Day or night are not a mixture of light and darkness. Okay, let's go to dusk. That's from the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. A middle degree between light and darkness. Number two, twilight. Again from the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. The faint light which is reflected upon the earth after sunset and before sunrise. The light seen in the sky during dusk in Hebrew Arab, the number H6153 is from the sun. B. Boker, number H1242, dawn as the break of a day, generally morning. In King James Version, it's translated early morning, moral, it's mixture of light and darkness. Dawn, the break of the day, the first appearance of light in the morning. Again, from Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Therefore, both dawn and dusk segments of the 24-hour cycle belong to the day season only. Let's view a chart next. In the first part of Genesis 1-5, the two larger portions of the 24-hour cycle I addressed first. I have named them light season and night season. In the second part of Genesis 1-5, the two smaller portions of the light season in the 24-hour cycle are addressed last. They are named morning Boker and evening Arab. Before we go any further, the first light on the first day was not from the sun. It was Yahweh's light. Also, there would not have been a small segment of dawn on the first day because Yahweh had not separated the Hoshek, the darkness, from his light yet. It's very likely on the second, third and fourth days of creative restoration there was a dawn segment of light to begin the day. We are not told and must accept this by faith. However, once the sun was restored with light on the fourth day there would have been a dawn segment of light just as we have today. This study on dawn is definitely applicable to the creation week. Genesis 1.16, the fourth cycle. And Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day. Therefore, since the fourth cycle, any light in the sky from the sun, including dawn and dusk, is considered part of the light season, not part of the night season. The night season never has light from the sun. Therefore, the night season has no further divisions according to the Creator. Later, the Hebrews divided the night season into three watches and the Romans divided it into four watches. 
We now know both the morning and the evening belong to the day season. Can we agree? Yet some still say morning should be listed first. Want to know why morning is not listed first? In Genesis 1, 2b and 3, the light was made first. There was no dawn on the first day. The Bible states, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. So the first thing that had been created or restored in verse 1 was definitely light. Then we have Genesis 1, 5b, and the evening. The light was restored or created first, as we just heard, and the evening follows. So after light was made, restored or created, the evening followed. After the evening turned to darkness, night followed. Very simple. So light was restored or created first, then the evening follows, and night follows the evening. Genesis 1 5 C and the morning were the first day. When the night was over, the morning followed. Day 1 is complete at dawn. Let's look at this uh, sketch here. Light was restored or created first. Number 2, the evening follows. Number 3, night follows the evening. And number 4, morning begins the new cycle, a new day. And the problem word. The next part of this study is going to address a problem in Genesis 1-5 created by the translators. So here we have the word and, the problem word. Genesis 1-5, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Number one, there are four and words in this one verse. Number two, the problem and is the one in red, as seen above. It is an added word and not found in the Hebrew text. Number three, also the word were. The Hebrew word number H, 1961, is very important, as we will see. Let's remember the word and between evening and morning is not in the original Hebrew text. It was added by the translators and it causes misunderstanding. The word where is number H 1961. Here is the definition. H 1961, haya, a primitive root, compare H 1933 to exist, be or become, come to pass, always emphatic, and not a mere copula or auxiliary. King James Version, beacon, altogether, be, come, accomplish, committed, like, break, cause, come to pass. Do, faint, fall, follow, happen, have last, pertain, quit oneself, require, use. The three main definitions for H1961 for were, as well as for and, that make any sense for Genesis 1b or 1.5b are to exist, to become, and to follow. The original King James wording in Genesis 1.5b reads as follows, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Let's note that scripture does not state that night, number H3915, 
and morning constitute a day, but evening, age 6153, and morning constitute a day. This is very important to understand. Please clear your mind from preconceived ideas and follow along with the biblical explanation being given. Evening number H6153 does not and cannot refer to night, H3915, but is in fact referring to the period of time between high noon and the point of darkness, which is night. Remember, the evening and morning are part of the day, the day season, and they are not part of the darkness, the night season. We must learn to read in context. Let's not read something into the text of the scriptures which is not there. The rendition was using the H 1961 definition followed or following makes good sense or the best sense. So let's look at it. The evening following the morning became or was the first day, meaning the light season. This is talking about the hours of daylight only. It is talking about the morning up to high noon and evening noon to dusk or the afternoon following the forenoon. This is a day season or 12 daylight hours. No night is involved at all. However, in the next slide, we will be using another translation of this verse that will support a 24-hour cycle, including the day season and the night season. Here is a rendition of the Good News Bible, which reads the same as the German Bible, the Schlachter and Elbefelde. And he named the light day and the darkness night. Evening passed and morning came. That was the first day. In this translation we have a 24-hour cycle including a full day and a full night following the day. Think about it. The evening cannot come and pass unless there is a daylight first. And the morning cannot come unless it follows a night first. First comes the evening at the end of the day and then comes the morning at the end of the night. By inserting the correct word it actually reverses the order of the day causing the evening to follow the morning. Maybe this seems too simple and a big surprise but the fact is that Genesis 1, 5b now comes into harmony with the rest of Scripture, especially the morning and evening sacrifices of the sanctuary service. The sanctuary services were always calculated with the day beginning at dawn. Compare the following six verses where each refers to the morning, Boker, number H1242, and evening, Arab, number H6153 in this order with no words between them to distort the correct context. First Samuel 17.16 it says And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. First Chronicles 1640 to offer burnt offerings unto Yahweh upon the altar of the burnt offering continually morning and evening and to do according to all that is written in the Torah of Yahweh which he commanded Israel. Second Chronicles 2 4 Behold I build an house to the name of Yahweh my God to dedicate it to him and to burn before him sweet incense, and for the continual showbread, and for the burnt offerings morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, and on the new moons, 
and on the solemn feasts of Yahweh, our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. Second Chronicle 31.3 He appointed also the king's portion of his substance for the burnt offerings, to wit, for the morning and evening burnt offerings, and the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths, and for the new moons, and for the set feasts, as it is written in the Torah of Yahweh. Then we have Ezra 3.3 3, And they set the altar upon his basis, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries, and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto Yahweh, even burnt offerings, morning and evening. And Psalm 65, 8, They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to rejoice. There are actually 28 scripture references in the King James Version that declare that the day precedes the night by simply stating day and night, rather than night and day. All of them are translated correctly. Could it be that the word and was supplied by the translators to replace the better word of followed, to sabotage the true meaning of the text? Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. The fact is, however, it happened, and all man-made mistakes must be corrected or we will continue to believe and teach error. Let's go to some Bible testimonies and to some Jewish historical witnesses. So next we will examine several biblical examples of when the day begins from Abraham, Moses, John and historical evidence. Bible testimony number one. That's in Genesis 14 and 15, Abraham's covenant with Yahweh. We will look at Yahweh's covenant to Abraham, which was recorded in Genesis 14 and 15. In Genesis 15, Yahweh tells Abraham in a vision, there is nothing to fear. He will be protected like a shield. Then Abraham was taken outside and told to count the stars with the promise, So shall thy seed be. Next, Abraham receives the command to prepare a formal treaty contract which consisted of a certain selection of animals and birds to be prepared in a specific manner which he did. When one studies carefully other scriptures, the discovery is made that this covenant between Yahweh and Abraham was made during the start of Yahweh's year, more specifically from the 14th day of the first month, which later was known as Passover. Abraham prepared the five sacrifices likely for a 3 p.m. time, which was the set time for the evening sacrifice. While Abraham was waiting for Yahweh to fulfill his part of the covenant agreement, the birds of prey hovered continually over the sacrifices, indicating this was indeed the daylight season. It was not yet dark, as the birds had not gone to roost yet. Then it states in Genesis 15:12 that Abraham fell into a deep sleep when the sun was going down, a sleep induced by God. He received a vision telling him that his descendants would be foreigners and immigrants in a land that does not belong to them for 400 long years. But God will judge the nations and bring his offspring forth with lots of wealth.
And then in Genesis 15:17, Yahweh completes the covenant, for it states, and it came to pass, that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. This was a two-part covenant agreement. First, one part, Abraham's performed during the light season, and second, one part, Yahweh's performed during the night season. This two-part covenant took place on the same 24-hour cycle day, not over a period of two days. This proves the night following the 3 p.m. sacrifices was part of the 24-hour cycle of the 14th day of Abib, the first month. Genesis 15:18 says, In the same day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham. Note, it does not say the next day or the next cycle. Let's compare what took place 430 years later when the Israelites and great multitude left Egypt. We read in Exodus 12.41 and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years even the self same day it came to pass that all the hosts of Yahweh went out from the land of Egypt Exodus 12.51 And it came to pass the self same day that Yahweh did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies. Jeremiah 34.13 Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, I made a covenant with your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondmen. Here we have a slide in which we try to explain in detail or simplify what actually took place at that time. Number one, Abraham began his part of the covenant during the light season, the day time of Abib 14 at approximately 3 p.m. Number two, according to Genesis 15:17, Yahweh fulfilled his part of the covenant when the smoking furnace and the burning lamp passed through the sacrificial pieces. And at what time? When the sun went down and it was dark, actually at midnight. Notice the forward progressive movement of events. So here we have a sketch starting at dawn. And uh, one dawn, two dawn, is a 24-hour cycle because dawn initiates a new cycle. We have the sunrise here, I'll be 14 days season. We have the ninth hour, the dusk, and the uh, night. I'll be 14, the night season. So let's go back here to number one. Abraham prepares the physical sacrifices for the agreement at the ninth hour or at 3 p.m according to Genesis 15.10. Number two, flying fowl attempt to eat the prepared sacrificial carcasses of the covenant agreement, according to Genesis 15.11. Number three, Abraham's portion of the covenant is complete and he awaits confirmation from Yahweh or Yahuwah. And he said unto Abraham, know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them for 400 years but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full that was spoken here by uh, Yahshua or Yahushua or Yahweh to Abraham in the deep darkness 
applied to him sometimes when the sun was going down. Number four, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces, see Exodus 12.29, for midnight pattern, application of smiting the Egyptians. Number five, Yahuwah, or Yahweh, fulfills his part of the covenant on the night of Abib 14. It says, In the same day the Lord Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Dawn is Yahweh's perfect design. Yahshua implemented it this way at creation. All we need to do is accept what is written, the way it is written, with rejoicing. Let's go to Bible testimony number 2 in Exodus 12, 1-10. Egypt's Passover. Let's read Exodus 12, 1-10 from the King James Version. And Yahweh spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up unto the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood, and strike it on the two side posts, and on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. The fourteenth day of the first month is a Passover. The Israelites were told to kill the lamb in the evening or in the afternoon when the sanctuary services are set up. This pattern continues. They were further instructed to eat the flesh of that lamb in that night, not the next day. Exodus 1, 14 states, This Passover meal was an ordinance to be kept forever. The meal was to be eaten on Passover day, at twilight, after sunset. In other words, the Israelites were to kill the lamb in the afternoon at the regularly scheduled time of 3 p.m. or between the evenings on the 14th day and eat it that night, which was still reckoned with the 14th. Furthermore, none of the Passover lamb was to remain until the morning, number H1242, or until the morrow. Number H1242. Between the evenings 
Bain Ha'abayim. What does that mean? These Hebrew words are first used in Exodus 12:6, And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it. Number 996, Bain, in the evening. Number 6153, Arbayim. Although most resources mention many interpretations of Bain, Ha, or Bayim, they mostly seem to agree that it means the time between noon and darkness. It is all the interesting to point out that a lot of the commentaries point to 3 p.m. in the afternoon or the Hebrew ninth hour of the day. So we have here the morning and evening and high noon, the light portion of the day divided into morning and evening. Very simple. Treasury of scripture and knowledge has this to say. In the evening, Hebrew between the two evenings. The Jews divided the day into morning and evening till the sun passed the meridian. All was morning or forenoon. After that, all was evening or afternoon. The first evening began just after 12 o'clock and continued till sunset. The second evening began at sunset and continued till night. During the whole time of twilight, between 12 o'clock, therefore, and the termination of twilight, the Passover was to be offered. This was from Treasury of Scripture Knowledge about Exodus 12, verse 6. So the evening portion is divided at 3 p.m. to represent between the evening. Between the evenings at the cross. We have high noon, the evening begins. We have 3 p.m. between the evenings. We have dusk, the evening ends. Although between the scholars there is continued controversy over when Bain Ha'abayim actually takes place, Yahweh's inspired scriptures without a doubt points to the period between noon and darkness. The sacrifice of the only begotten Son has given us the most documented sacrifice ever. Yahshua's death at 3 p.m. on the 14th of Abib was definitely between the evenings. Bain Ha Abayim helps us to see the connection. This is taken from this website paleotimes.org Here we have a second witness in Second Chronicles chapter 35 verse 1 and verses 13 to 14 and 16. Moreover, Josiah kept Passover under Yahweh in Jerusalem and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. And they roasted the Passover with fire according to the ordinance. But the other holy offerings sought they in pots and in cauldrons and in pans and divided them speedily among all the people. Verse 14 and afterwards they made ready for themselves and for the priests, because the priests, the sons of Aaron, were busied in offering of burnt offerings and the fat until night. Therefore the Levites prepared for themselves and for the priests, the sons of Aaron. Verse 16 So all the service of Yahweh was prepared the same day to keep the Passover 
and to offer burnt offerings upon the altar of Yahweh according to the commandment of King Josiah. In these foregoing verses, we are told that all the service of Yahweh was prepared the same day. In other words, they killed, cooked, and ate the lamb on the 14th day. These tasks took place during the hours of the light season and the night season. That means the time after sundown was still the 14th day. And as we read earlier in Exodus 12.10, whatever remained of the Passover lamb on the last hours of the 14th cycle of Passover had to be burned before the dawning of the new cycle, the 15th day. Remember the death angel passed over that same night. It passed over on Passover day at midnight, which was still on the hours of the 14th cycle, and not the beginning of the 15th or the next cycle. To celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread properly, Yahweh commands unleavened bread must be eaten with the Passover supper from the evening of the day before, specifically on the 14th day. I hope you noticed in Exodus 12.18 there was a specific command to begin eating unleavened bread on the 14th day of the month at even. Yet the Feast of Unleavened Bread does not begin until the morning of the 15th of Abib according to Leviticus 23.6. There are similar patterns for the weekly Sabbath, the Feast Sabbath, especially the Day of Atonement. See Leviticus 23, 26-32. Let's go to Bible Testimony number 3, Leviticus 23, 16-32. Answers for the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is the tenth day of the seventh month. Leviticus 23, 26-27 says, And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. We already know the tenth day begins only at dawn. Sabbath Requirement if we are to honor the Holy Sabbath hours, one of the first requirements is to work six days, then rest the seventh day. Patterns for work days, work during the light season hours, and rest during the night season. Pattern for the Sabbath day, worship during the light season hours, rest during the night season hours. No restrictions no requirements on types of food that could be eaten on the seventh day Sabbath feast. Food patterns and the feasts. Every feast day has a specific food pattern. Let's examine them briefly. Passover. Unleavened bread was commanded to be eaten on the evening of the 14th day before the Feast of Unleavened Bread began. Unleavened Bread Feast Unleavened Bread was commanded to be eaten for this seven-day feast. Pentecost Two barley loaves were waved before the Father. This was leavened bread. Trumpets In preparation for the Day of Atonement, many usually chose to deny themselves some sweet treat for the 40 day before atonement, usually apples dipped in honey. Tabernacles, no restrictions on what could be eaten of the clean foods listed in the Torah. Day of Atonement has two specific requirements. 
Both are referred to three times each. Day of Atonement Requirement Number 1 Leviticus 23, 26-27 And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day, beginning at dawn, of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. The first requirement is, no manner of work is permitted. And ye shall do no work in that same day, and whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest on the tenth day of the seventh month. Remember? No manner of work. The second requirement is to afflict your soul. We read here, And ye shall afflict your souls, for whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted, in that same day he shall be cut off from among his people and verse 32 ye shall afflict your souls what does it mean to afflict one's soul so the question is how do we afflict our souls as required in Leviticus 23 26 to 27 in Isaiah 58.3 it states, Wherefore have we fasted? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul? Fasted comes from the Hebrew word H6684 to cover the mouth or to fast. Acts 27.9 Sailing was now dangerous because the day of atonement, the fast, was now already past. Fast comes from the Greek word G 3521, abstinence of food of voluntary and religious, specifically the fast of the Day of Atonement. To afflict one's soul for Day of Atonement means a celebration of a total fast of no food and no water. And ye shall afflict your souls. What day? In the ninth day of the month, when? At even. How long? From even to even. The total fast begins at even on the ninth day of the seventh month. So when is the actual day of atonement date? According to Leviticus 23, the Day of Atonement date is on the tenth day, beginning at dawn of the seventh month, there shall be a Day of Atonement. But the affliction time, the fasting time, starts at the even on the ninth day. Leviticus 23, Atonement Affliction, Celebration Time, and ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Purpose for beginning the fast on the ninth day. When the fast began at even, twelve hours before dawn, the soul was sure to be afflicted for the hours of day of atonement until the fast was completed at the even 24 hours later. Comparison of patterns for Passover and Atonement Passover celebrate with unleavened bread on the even of the 14th day of the first month. Atonement celebrate with a total fast of 24 hours in the seventh month beginning at even of the ninth day to the even of the tenth day. Termination of fasting celebration is on the tenth day. 
Once the sanctuary services for Day of Atonement were completed and the sins were removed from the camp, this likely would have been at the ending of the light season. As dusk even approach, the celebration of fasting will end. Now that the people have been sealed, it would be a joyous time. Would the fast have been broken with a wonderful feast? What do you think? Something to think about. If Atonement Day really began at sunset on the 9th, counting at the beginning of the 10th, the sunset theory command would have simply been to keep the Day of Atonement on the 10th. There would have been no need to emphasize a Sabbath beginning on the eve of the 9th. Besides, the eve of the 9th actually commences at sunset on the 8th in sunset theory. So sunset theory does not work. Faulty arguments are not scriptural. Many use Leviticus 23.32 as proof the Sabbath begins at sunset, thinking this is the same as even. However, the thinking individual will realize that these verses prove the exact opposite. It's a fast that begins at even, not the feast Sabbath. Bible testimony number four. Exodus 14, Pharaoh's chariots. No wheels, no deals. The account of Moses leading the Israelites through the Red Sea was recorded under inspiration. So it would do us well to search for truth in this extremely interesting account. Will this event show that dawn starts the day, or will it show that sunset is the beginning of the new cycle? Our investigation into the timing of events begins at the beach of the Red Sea. Exodus 14.10 And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto Yahweh. If the Israelites observed the Egyptians a distance off, it was obviously during the light season. Be attentive to the next words of Moses. Exodus 14.13 And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again, no more for ever. Remember, the word Yom is the original word for today, and can mean 12 hours or 24 hours depending on the context. According to sunset theory, Moses would be declaring that Yahweh was going to show his salvation or plan of final deliverance before sunset. The light season of the day, the last part of the 24-hour cycle in sunset theory, was a time that Yahweh's people identified the Egyptians as pursuing them. According to sunset theory, the Israelites would be free of the Egyptians that were following them today, just as Moses had promised, meaning before sunset. Did this actually happen by sunset? Eventually, the angel of Yahweh relocated from the front of the camp to the back of the camp 
providing the necessary protection and light during God's today hours of salvation as given by Moses. Here is what we read in Exodus fourteen, nineteen to 20. Next, the angel of God, who was going ahead of the camp of Israel, moved away and went behind them. And the column of cloud moved away from, in front of them, and stood behind them. It stationed itself between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. There was cloud and darkness here, but light by night there, so that the one did not come near to the other all night long. These two verses reveal the details for the light season and the following night season that provided protection for the Israelites. Yahweh arranged and provided life savings events for the Israelites in the night season of the today hours. Yahweh physically demonstrated the primary segment of promised salvation claimed by Moses at the exact time specified. However, sunset came and went, and the salvation was not yet complete. Yet according to sunset theory, once the sun sets, the new day begins as a tomorrow, not a today. Yahweh's salvation of today started in the light season and continued seamlessly into the following night season. The promise spoken by Moses for the today's deliverance was unfolding in miraculous wonder. Today, Exodus 14.13 evidently did not end at sunset during the hours of this incredible event, but salvation did come during the 24-hour cycle. Let's read Exodus 14:21 to 22. Moshe reached his hand out over the sea, and Adonai caused the sea to go back before a strong east wind all night. He made the sea become dry land, and its water was divided in two. Then the people of Israel went into the sea on the dry ground, with the water walled up for them on the right hand and on the left. The promise from Yahweh was he would literally demonstrate to the Hebrew people his physical salvation. I believe the Hebrews were able to visually see number one, the angel of Yahweh, Yeshua, relocating to the rear of the camp in the light season. Number two, Moses stretching out his arm to command the east wind. Number three, the strong wind dividing the waters. Number four, the miraculous corridor being exposed, drying a path across the Red Sea. Number five, the towering walls of water on either side while hurrying to the other shore during the night season. Number six, the sea water crashing together, enveloping the doomed Egyptians in the morning of the next day. Yahweh was indeed showing his salvation to the terrified Hebrews today or that night. Let's read Exodus 14, 24 to 26. Just before dawn, Adonai looked out on the Egyptian army through the column of fire and cloud and threw them into a panic. He caused the wheels of the chariots to break off, so that they could move only with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Adonai is fighting for Israel against the Egyptians. Let's get away from them. Adonai said to Moshe, Reach your hand out over the sea, and the water will return and cover the Egyptians with their chariots and cavalry. This took place just before dawn 
meaning within the 24-hour cycle Moses had promised. All of the events that occurred from the light season of promise, spoken by Moses until the minutes just before the dawn of the morning, were unfolding within Yahweh's time from the today that started with the conversation between Moses and Yahweh. Moshe reached his hand out over the sea, and by dawn the sea had returned to its former depths. The Egyptians tried to flee, but Adonai swept them into the sea. This was the final act of salvation for the Hebrew people at dawn. Bible Testimony number 5, Exodus 16, the Manna Week. The Manifestation When the mixed multitude left Egypt, the Hebrew majority had all but forgotten the law of Yahweh. The whole camp arrived on the fifteenth day of the second month in the wilderness of Sin, according to Exodus 16.1, hungry, in a foul mood, and complaining to Moses about their conditions. Yahweh told them that he was going to feed them bread, manna from heaven. He related the exact purpose, only to Moses first, that accompanied the bread in verses 4 to 5. Then said Yahweh unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my Torah or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Yeshua is preparing the people for the first feast day on his calendar, which is the seventh day Sabbath. Number one, the first step was to collect one single omer per person per each cycle for five cycles in consecutive order. Number two, the second step was to collect a double portion on the sixth cycle morning to provide for the last two cycles of the week. To effectively complete the six commanded tasks before the seventh day Sabbath, it is necessary to begin at the point of commencement for cycle one, not in the middle of the cycle one, as sunset theory would dictate, because the morning would be halfway through the first 24 hour cycle. Otherwise, the required full six cycles before the Seventh day Sabbath would be incomplete. Therefore, in Exodus 16, 4 and 5, Yeshua was communicating with Moses on the Seventh day Sabbath prior to the start of the first cycle, Sunday. A double portion of manna would be collected on the sixth cycle to provide food for the Seventh day Sabbath without the necessary labor. In Exodus 16.8, Moses declares the manna would arrive in the morning, age 12.42, Booker, meaning the next five days in the morning. Then on the sixth cycle morning, they were to gather for two cycles, preparation day and Sabbath, because none would fall on the morning of the weekly Sabbath. The Israelites were specifically instructed not to leave any manna until the morning on the first five cycles because the new manna cycle would arrive the next morning, not at sunset. The manna was no longer edible with the cycle changed in the morning, but it was still fine at sunset. Morning is divinely appointed to launch new phases and new cycles every day. According to Exodus 16.22, they would gather twice as much on the sixth cycle, so they had enough for the weekly Sabbath. Moses states in verse 23, 
Tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto Yahweh. Why did Moses say tomorrow? Referring to the seventh cycle, Boker, or morning, instead of saying tonight, at Friday night, sunset, which is the beginning of the Sabbath day, in sunset theory. Did Moses not know the Sabbath begins at sunset? What about the so-called twelve holy night hours of Sabbath? After Friday sunset, this holy time prior to the tomorrow and prior to the manor cycle exchange point. If the announcement of the set-apart Sabbath to begin at sunset was so massively important, then Moses, the audible voice of Yahweh to the Hebrews, blatantly disregarded this announcement. Moses said the Sabbath was approaching tomorrow. The Exodus 16.23 announcement of exactly when the Sabbath was to commence had to be very firm, because the majority of the people had, for all intents and purposes, forgotten Yahweh's Torah. And the great multitude didn't know in the first place. Therefore, the intricate fine details of exactly when the Sabbath begins needed to be brought to their attention. Let's ask the question again. Why did Moses not inform his people that the approaching night would begin Sabbath at sunset? Could it be that Sabbath on Friday night does not exist? Every person that Moses let out of Egypt depended totally on him for Yahweh's important instructions, specifically about the impending Sabbath that was soon approaching. Now here we have a chart which may help us in details to understand what happened during the Manor Week. And the Manor Week proves that the day actually starts at dawn and not at sunset as we have been taught. Number one, upper colored brackets outline the first five daily cycles. Number two, the 24 hour cycles, days, now start at dawn according to Yahweh's creation format, where the light season is followed by the night season. The gold brackets, the manor cycles, are perfectly synchronized with the dawn to dawn Genesis creation format, beginning on the first cycle of the manor week. Number four, the purple manor bracket spans two full cycles from Friday dawn to Sunday dawn. It was promised the manor would stay fresh for these 48 hours. The manor did not decay when sunset arrived on Sabbath night because that was not the beginning of any new cycle for them and it isn't for us either as we have traditionally been taught. Now let's examine the chart further on the next slide. Let's go to the first box here. Yahshua or Yahweh instructs Moses on the seventh day Sabbath concerning the manna cycle week according to Exodus 16.5. In the number two box, the people learn the weekly cycle pattern from the manna cycles. These are the gold brackets, exemplified by Yahweh or Yahshua, aimed at and controlled by a most important function of the body, namely energy replacement. That means when we are hungry, we will pay attention. Number three, Man arrives for the morning, the green arrow, Exodus 16, 12 and 13, on the sixth cycle morning, beginning of purple bracket. They gather twice a manna, Exodus 16, 22. Moses speaks at the red arrow, tomorrow, the blue bracket on the 22nd day, is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto Yahweh. That which remains over lay up for you unto the morning. 
Tomorrow, Boca, is the Sabbath. Boca means the dawn of morning, the next day. And here we have the preparation cycle, the manifestation. In the number one box, mana double portion duration period starts at dawn, the sixth day, during the light hours. Number two, Yeshua or Yahweh words to Moses. Tomorrow, see the gold arrow, is the rest of the Holy Sabbath under Yahweh. Exodus 16.23 Moses spake these words knowing that dawn ends the preparation day and starts the Sabbath day. Box number three. Bake. Seeth. And that which remaineth over lay up for you until the morning. This is the brown arrow. Verses 23 continued. And box number four. Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto Yahweh. Spoken by Moses on Sabbath morning, today is from dawn Sabbath morning before sunrise until darkness arrives with sighting of three stars. So you may have to take yourself some time to look through these charts slowly and uh, step by step until you understand and grasp how important this manna cycle is in order to understand that the day does start at dawn and not at sunset as we have been taught. The manna week does not support sunset at the commencement of Sabbath or any other day. Conclusion for manna week we know for sure Moses said in Exodus 16.23 that the Sabbath started at tomorrow by using the Hebrew word Boker. However, if Moses really meant the Sabbath was to begin at Friday night sunset, he should have used the Hebrew phrase Shemesh, bow. But that creates another problem. Why? Because Shemesh, bow refers to both the sun coming up and the sun going down. So Moses would have had to then qualify if he meant the Sabbath begins with the Shemesh bow of the sun going down or the Shemesh bow of the sun coming up. Moses' instructions align 100% with dawn. Bible testimony number six, Roman reckoning of a day, and we find that in John 19 and Matthew 27. The question is, what is Roman reckoning? Roman reckoning starts the civil 24-hour period from midnight to midnight, as we see on this little sketch here. Roman reckoning scriptures. We have Matthew twenty seven nineteen, John nineteen thirteen and fourteen, John chapter twenty verse one and verse nineteen. So let's read Matthew twenty seven nineteen in the King James Version. When he, Pilate, was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. So let's first read uh, John nineteen thirteen and 14. Pilate brought Yeshua forth and sat down in the judgment seat, and it was a preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. What time did Pilate sit down? It's at the sixth hour. So the sixth hour in Hebrew reckoning would have been 12 noon. Now the question, how is it possible for Pilate to be sitting on the judgment seat about the sixth hour when according to Luke 23 Yeshua was already on the cross for three hours? 
according to Yeshua and Luke, the sixth hour is always high noon. Luke 23, 44, And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. At the sixth hour, the soldiers had already argued about his clothes, offered him vinegar, put a sign above him, and the conversation with the thief had already taken place. So let's read some Bible verses to this effect. Matthew 27:45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness. Mark 15:33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over all the earth. Luke 23:44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth. So let's go to John 19:14 and 16. And it was a preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. Then delivered he, Pilate, him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Yahshua, and led him away. Is John's witness saying something different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Confusing? What time is the sixth hour that John was writing about? We know for certain that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were counting the hours in scriptural style. That means dawn begins the count towards the next dawn from the first hour mark to the 24 hour where the cycle ends. Where did John start counting from? Matthew twenty seven nineteen when he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in the dream because of him. What type of day was Pilate's wife claiming? Pilate and his wife were Roman citizens, living in the Roman theme. Pilate's wife had a dream in this day. We know that Yeshua was in their kangaroo court all night. It was very early in the morning when Pilate was interrogating Yeshua. For Pilate's wife to have a dream prior to this particular morning and claim it to be on the exact same day as when Pilate seated himself in the judgment seat, it is necessary that Pilate's wife had the dream after midnight and before dawn. Here is another charge which may help us to understand more clearly what took place at that time. Items to observe, dawn and Roman reckoning will justify two verses and two people at the same time. However, this is only the start and we will see it more clearly in the next slide. Pilate's wife has a dream. Box number one. Abib 13, night season. Gethsemane, betrayal, and the kangaroo court. Trials begins and lasts until dawn. Until Abib 14. Box number two. Pilate sits in the judgment seat in the sixth hour, John 19.14. John was living in Antioch, a Roman city, writing to Roman people, using Roman reckoning. For Roman people to accept this message, it was necessary to write in recognized Roman terms and time peripheries. Box number three. Pilate's wife, a Roman citizen, speaking to her husband, the Roman governor, using Roman reckoning of time, tells Pilate, late dawn, that her dream of Yeshua occurred in this Roman civil 24-hour period. That dream occurred within the sixth hour between midnight and the time Pilate sat on the judgment seat. Yes, it was in fact 
this day to a Roman citizen, according to Matthew 27, 19. And take your time, go through this chart, so you understand and see exactly what took place. And it will open your eyes and you will understand. It's all very plain and easy to understand. To a Roman citizen, yes indeed, it certainly was the sixth hour, 6 a.m. of the day when Pilate took the judgment seat on the morning of Abib 14, on a Wednesday. John's account using Roman reckoning is now in perfect alignment with the Torah. Attention! Matthew, Mark and Luke using dawn calculation and John using Roman calculation are now all in perfect agreement for number one the timing of the trials midnight onward number two the start of Abib 14 at dawn and number three the start of the crucifixion at the third hour or 9 a.m. Question do you actually realize the depth of the statement on the last slide? Do you realize that it took the dawn design from Yahweh with an understanding of Roman reckoning to accomplish this formerly perceived impossible feat? Where is sunset theory found? It simply does not exist. It is now very clear how the confusion over timing issues can arise if one does not understand that John uses Roman reckoning for the start of each day as written in scripture so plainly. Once this is pointed out, all becomes easy to understand, answering many questions about the scriptures. Let's go to John, chapter 20, verse 1. This text may be one of the most convoluted texts in all the scriptures. The dragon definitely wants this text misunderstood. Let's read it. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. The part the first day of the week, when it was yet dark, has become one of the most prolific portions of the Messianic Testament to promote a first day or Sunday resurrection. Thinking in the Pharisees' tradition of the sunset to sunset dogmatic theory, these words definitely, without doubt, ensure a first day resurrection. When Mary went to the tomb on the first day of the week, according to John 20 verse 1, number 1. Was it during the night season hours of the Sabbath, the seventh cycle? Or number 2. Was it already Sunday, in pagan Roman terms, the first cycle of the week? Here we have another chart Mary's arrival at the tomb in darkness when was it was it Sabbath just before the dawn of Sunday or did Mary actually arrive on Sunday let's go to box number one Yahweh Zion reckoning Mary arrives at the tomb in darkness it is the final minutes of Abib 17 the Sabbath day time hours ended at dusk and is now near the end of Yahweh's 24-hour cycle. The seventh cycle will change into the first cycle when the first light of dawn arrives. And we can kind of follow it on this sketch here. Box number two, Roman time reckoning. Mary arrives at the tomb upon the Sunday morning of Roman reckoning. Note the red error. It is already six hours into Abib 18 and still dark. 
It is Rome's civil 24-hour cycle that starts at midnight and ends the same day. John has recorded the event in this way to achieve readership from the intended audience of the Roman Empire. So again the question must be asked, did Mary arrive at the tomb on Sunday, the first cycle of the week, or was it considered the Sabbath day when she arrived? Number one, according to scripture, standard time where dawn begins the new day. This was not the first cycle of the week, rather it was near the finish of the night season of Sabbath, the seventh cycle. According to Roman reckoning, yes, it was already Sunday, the first day of the week, because the Romans calculated the first hour of their 24-hour cycle beginning at midnight. This then would have been about the sixth hour of Sunday or 6 a.m. in the morning. According to the sunset to sunset theory, it was also the first day of the week, because the theory's new day starts at sunset. All problems should now be cleared up. We could cite many more examples in scriptures like Genesis 19, Lot's inebriated blunders, Genesis 31, Laban and Jacob's covenant at Mizpah, Exodus 10, myriads of ravaging locusts, Leviticus chapter 7, to eat or not to eat. Chapter 6 and 7, a fleece, clay pots and shofars. 1 Samuel 5, Dagon the fish god exposed. 1 Samuel 19, evading the javelin of the mad king. 1 Samuel 30, David smites the Amalekites. Ruth chapter 2, Ruth replied to Naomi. After careful study of these events and more, it will be discovered that they all support the fact that a day starts at dawn and not at sunset. Now let's go to Jewish testimony number seven. Will history agree with scripture? We have some historical evidence. The exact century for the appearance of the tradition to hallow the Sabbath from sunset to sunset is probably unknown to Jews themselves. When the tradition is thousands of years old and the Bible says nothing about it, sometimes it's difficult to identify when, why, and by whom it was established. If only there was some information written on clay tablets or parchment or papyrus that would help. The modern reckoning of days, when a 24-hour day begins at night, is not a divine institution, but a human precept. In the same way, we could reckon days from 8 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the evening, and it would not hurt anyone. But the modern reckoning is rooted in dim and distant past, and who would say whether the nations adopted the tradition from the Jews or the Jews adopted their Sunday tradition from the nations. Where a 24-hour day begins at night, specifically sunset. How was the day start reckoned before the Babylonian captivity or before Moses or before Abraham and the Deluge? If we ask the Jews whether they know since when Israel has hallowed the Sabbath from sunset to sunset, maybe we will hear, yes, we do know, since the times of Moses. But we can read the Torah and the book of Yeshua from cover to cover and find no evidence that in the times of Moses or Yeshua, there was a tradition to hallow the weekly Sabbath from sunset to sunset. Moreover, we will find nothing about it in the whole Tanakh. We can find only one thing in the books of Moses, that daytime precedes night 
within God's day. Why did the Jews not see it? Some people, former heathens, who do not speak Hebrew, saw it, and the Jews did not. How could it happen? And could it happen at all? Unfortunately, or fortunately, it could happen and did happen. The birth of the King of the Jews, Yeshua HaMashiach, was first revealed to the sages of the Orient and not to those of Israel. Although the Jews had all the advantages, the prophecies from their own scriptures that the Jews could not grasp were understood by former heathen Christians. Is this not strange? Paul the Apostle, mourning for his people, writes about their spiritual condition in 2 Corinthians 3, 14 to 17. But the minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Messiah. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon the heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to Yahweh, the veil shall be taken away. Second Corinthians three, fourteen to sixteen. Let's go to historical evidence number one. This is from the book Jewish Encyclopedia, page four seventy five. This historical evidence supports the biblical truism that a day begins at dawn. Meaning of day in the Bible, the season of light, Genesis 1, 5, lasting from dawn, literally the rising of the morning, to the coming forth of the stars. Historical evidence number two. This is from the book Jewish Festivals, History and Observance, page 13. In order to assure against profanation of the Sabbath, the Jews added the late Friday afternoon hours to the Sabbath. Note, the Jews changed the configuration of a day and added the time between sunset and sunrise to the day. This is not biblical, but constitutes a pharisaical approach. Historical evidence number three. This is taken from the book Judaism, Between Yesterday and Tomorrow, page 518. If we look at the essentials of a day of rest and reflection, which has a religious orientation, it is possible to justify the shifting of Sabbath worship to Friday evening. The celebration of the vigil night watch was moved back to the eve of the feast as early as the Middle Ages. Historical evidence number four. This is taken from the book Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 11, page 1068. A sacred day of rest on the seventh day, the Sabbath. Days were reckoned from morning to morning. Even the Roman system knows the dawn truth. Historical evidence number five from the book Catholic Encyclopedia, volume 11, section entitled Later Jewish Calendar. Following the reign of King Josiah, 640 to 609, and especially after the Babylonian exile, a number of significant and enduring changes occurred in the Israelite calendar, showing that their time, the day, however, was counted from evening to evening after the Babylonian fashion. Historical evidence number six from the book The Calendars of Ancient Israel, page 146. Shortly after the beginning of the Greek period, 236 BC, came the change in the method of reckoning the day, from evening to evening, instead of from morning to morning as of old. Historical evidence number seven. This is from Jacob Z. Lauterbach, Rabbinical Essays, Hebrew Union College Press, Cincinnati, Ohio, 
from the year of 1951. He says, There can be no doubt that in pre-exilic times, meaning before the Babylonian captivity, the Israelites reckoned the day from morning to morning. The day began with the dawn and closed with the end of the night following it, with the last moment before the dawn of the next morning. The very description of the extent of the day in the biblical account of creation as given in Genesis 1.5 presupposes such a system of reckoning the day. For it says, And it was evening, and it was morning, one day. This passage, Genesis 1.5, was misunderstood by the Talmud. It was correctly interpreted by R. Samuel B. Meir, who lived in 1100 to 1160, when he remarked, It does not say that it was night time, and it was daytime, which made one day, but it says it was evening, which means that the period of the daytime came to an end and the light disappeared. And when it says it was morning, it means that the period of the night time came to an end and the morning dawned then one whole day was completed in conclusion Yahweh is a logical God let us also use the logic he has given us to understand what has been presented is indeed biblically accurate and very correct Number one, does it make logical sense for a day to begin at sunset, at a time when man has finished from his daily labor? Number two, is it logical for a new day to begin at a time when man is exhausted from his daily work? Number three, does it make sense for a day to begin at night, after the day has died out? The night time is a time for sleep, not new beginnings. Number four, does it make sense for a fresh new day to begin when mankind and creation as a whole goes to sleep? Absolutely not. Number five, on the other hand, does it make sense, much more sense, that a day begins at dawn for daily new beginnings? Number six, does it not make more sense for a day to begin at dawn than most life forms on this earth awake for a fresh start to a bright new day? Absolutely. Number seven, if you can't figure it out, listen for the birds, because they know. Our Creator has given us another witness in nature, the birds. They begin to sing with the first light of dawn when the Creator's day really begins. What biblical proof is there for a midnight to midnight day or a sunset to sunset day? There is none. All we have is tradition. Clear biblical proof demonstrates that a day always begins at dawn. Please study the scriptural truth with an open mind clear of all preconceived ideas, proving all things with scriptures, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21. A new day starts with the first dawning light from the sun in the morning. Praise Yahweh, for He has lifted the sunset burden. When we wake up in the morning, we start a new day. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom.